What is up everybody? Welcome to another video from the Geek Pantheon. And today I'm going to be reviewing Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. First off, a huge thank you to Wizards of the Coast for sending me this copy. They did provide it for me for review purposes so I could get it to you all before the book comes out and let you know whether or not it is worth your time to pick it up. Spoilers, I think it is. But I just wanted to give them a huge shout out and thank them for providing me with the book. So the purpose of this video is going to be to do a, an overview of the book some idea of what's in it so you can make an informed decision as to whether or not you want or need to pick it up. Uh, I'm not going to do too deep of a dive into the contents of the book simply because there's 22 new subclasses in the first chapter alone. And if I did a deep dive, we'd be here for hours, but I am going to be doing videos where I dive deeper into each of the subclasses brought to us in Tasha's cauldron of everything in the coming weeks. So definitely subscribe to the channel. If you're interested in that and you want to learn more, about subclasses like blade singing and how they've updated that from Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide or brand new stuff like the Armor Artifice subclass. Uh, both of those are really cool. They're some of my favorites and I'm excited to do deep dives into those which will be coming in the next few weeks. So I'm gonna be hitting the highlights and the lowlights letting you know which parts of the book really shine and which I think maybe the ball got dropped a little bit and uh, hopefully by going over all that, you will know whether or not you want to pick up the book. First things first, though, is the intro to the book. So the intro has a great rules refresher that may not be useful for some of you, but it does cover what I would say are a lot of the most asked about rules online, at least that I can see. Stuff like, do I round up or down when I need to round a number? Or uh, when I use my bonus action to cast a spell, what can I use my action for? Stuff like that. So good reminders, and I think they also were kind of looking online to see what questions were being asked and use that opportunity to kind of give a refresher in the intro of this book. And like Xanathar and Morden Kanan before her, Tasha's intro to the book is a welcomed bit of levity and flavor into what could otherwise have turned out to be a rather dry book, given that it's just kind of a rules dump as opposed to an adventure with a story weaved throughout it. So Tasha does have a really fun intro and she does provide her opinion on various sections of the book throughout. So like I said, chapter one is a huge chapter, 22 new subclasses. So if you are looking for new character options, this is a good book to pick up. Now there are five reprinted subclasses from other sources. So the reprinted ones are the Wizard's Blade Singing, the Order Domain for the Cleric, the Druid Circle of Spores, the Paladin's Oath of Glory, and the uh, Bard's College of Eloquence. And so those come from other sources that you may already own. But the character options chapter kicks off with, I think, what a lot of people were hoping would fix a lot of uh, perceived issues in Dungeons and Dragons with the customizing origin section of this chapter. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about the role that racial abilities play in Dungeons and Dragons. This video is not going to do a deep dive on that. We do not have time. This book is dense. But for people who were excited about Wizards of the Coast to provide something different than racial abilities. This is kind of a letdown simply because they just kind of say, okay, do it. Like if you're playing an elf, but you want them to be strong, then just take their plus two and put it into strength. It doesn't give you any flavorful justification for making those changes. Honestly, the ancestry and culture supplement that's available on DMs Guild, it's, it's third party, but it does a great job of allowing you to mix and match your ancestry and your culture and provide a truly unique feeling character. And this section of the book honestly was a big letdown because I feel like they just, they said, okay, you can do it, which is fine if you are playing at a table that is hardcore, like first party content only, only stuff produced by WotC. Now you have something you can take to your DM and say, okay, now I can do a smart half work, please. But yeah, no, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it. I was personally let down by it. I felt like it was just kind of, it, it fell flat. And uh, it was probably my most disappointing section of the book, if I'm being perfectly honest. But the custom lineage sidebar that is in this section also is nice. It kind of gives you just a simple template for creating your own lineages and ancestries and things like that. It's a very small part of the section, but it is nice to have. The next part of chapter one is about changing a skill. And what they've done is they've actually given you the option when you're picking your proficiencies at character creation, when you hit level four, when you get your ability score improvement option, 
then you have the option to swap out a skill. So if you took one and it turns out the campaign that you're playing isn't really going to reward you having proficiency in survival, you can take that proficiency and throw it over to perception or something like that, which I think is great. I, I think that is a good thing to allow players to do. At the same time, I think limiting it to these kind of milestones throughout leveling is a good balance. It still makes those choices important. It, it still has meaning. And you once you make that choice, you have to stick with it for a certain amount of time. But it allows players to kind of alter their character a little bit here and there and reflect some changes in the story, maybe. If um, your character lost an eye in a battle and they were proficient in perception and now they have disadvantage on every roll, well, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that that character would uh, keep their skills up in perception because they're they're not going to be using it that much. So being able to take that proficiency and put it elsewhere makes total sense from even a storytelling standpoint for that character. And the last section before we get into the really crunchy bits of the actual subclasses in the character creation chapter is changing subclasses. So they, they provide you with an option if you are playing a champion fighter and you want to become a battle master you now have a path for that to happen which is really cool it it has the potential to create a lot of admin for you and the dm depending on how many things you have that are contingent on you being this type of wizard or this type of warlock or rogue or whatever so that can be kind of a hassle but i like that it's an option now and it, they kind of present two different ways of looking at it. They have the the slow burn version where it gives good outlines for the monetary and time costs of slowly training into a new subclass. But then it also talks about those sudden changes that can happen where uh, a paladin might like all of a sudden switch to Oath of Vengeance because an entire village got wiped out and they go and to solitude for a week. And when they emerge, they now have this new passion and this new drive in life. So I like both of those, and I think both of those can be really useful tools for players and DMs to make characters feel real and feel like they're progressing and learning and changing over time. Okay, the first big section is the Artificer, which Tasha has to say, Artificers invent cutting-edge problems and then try to solve them loudly and often with collateral damage. That's just one of the quotes that Tasha has throughout this book. I just wanted to share one of them with you so you get a sense of what she has to say. But she has them for each subclass. Uh, lots of sections throughout the book have Tasha's insight, which they did a really good job at writing. It, it feels very natural. I feel like Xanathar at certain times in Xanathar's Guide to Everything seemed very scatterbrained and not really cohesive and like he was responding to the text. Tasha very much feels like she's editing. Uh, something and providing her notes on on what's going on in the text, which I really liked. But anyway, the Artificer is what you found in Eberron Rising from the Last War with the updated um, errata, of course. And yeah, there's nothing really new in the actual Artificer class. We do get into the subclass, though, the Armorer, which is Fantasy Iron Man. Like I said, I can't go into a whole lot of depth. We'll do videos on deep dives for each of these subclasses, but I'm just going to kind of power through all of them. And I don't want to take up too much time of the review uh, doing too deep of a dive on any one subclass. But before we move on, the Artificer did also get some new infusions that they get to use. My personal favorite is the Mind Sharpener, which basically gives you legendary resistance on concentration checks up to four times a day, which is really cool and really useful. So yeah, definitely check those out. There is a fair number of new ones and also the reprinted ones from Eberron. Okay, and before we move on, just real quick, if you would rather talk to me in real time and get my thoughts on the book or any other D&D stuff, then I do stream on Twitch every Tuesday and Sunday. Come on over there, hang out and chat, and have a good time. And yeah, I'll, I'll answer questions and we can just hang out and talk about anything and everything. Okay, next up, barbarian subclasses. You have Path of the Beast, which is feral barbarians. Be really cool for like a non-cursed lycanthrope if you wanted to do that. And Path of Wild Magic, Wild Magic Table, every time that you rage, which causes a lot of wonderful chaos on the battlefield. So definitely cool. Bard, College of Creation is one of the new subclasses. Really cool, really flavorful, all about creating things out of nothing. The Moat of Inspiration is a really cool class feature that adapts based on how party members use your bardic inspiration 
and some of them are really cool. So definitely check that one out. Bard College of Eloquence. You can get a guaranteed 17 on a perception check if you build a character right starting at third level, which I think is breaking for social encounters, but I already went on this rant in my Mythic Odysseys of Theros review, so go watch that if you want the full rant and rave. Anyway, I think it's fine, but that one ability, Silver Tongued, is broken, and I wouldn't allow it at my table. Cleric, you get the Order Domain from Ravnica, which is cool. It's a Thord hated figure, City Watch, that idea of a high-ranking member of the faith bringing justice and keeping things in order. And then you have the Peace Domain, which is a a good redirect of the love domain that they made in Unearthed Arcana that was kind of a misstep. But my one gripe with it is one of the features it, get, it gets is potent spellcasting, which increases your damage. But it's the peace domain. So why are you worried about doing more damage? But anyway. Druids. Circle of Spores. Necromantic Druid. Bring things to life with fungus. Super neat. And <laughs> the Circle of Wildfire, which gets you a companion made of fire. And the things that you can do with this companion are really cool and I think will evoke a lot of really great stories around the table, maybe tragic stories surrounding this wildfire spirit. But it's definitely one of my favorites from like a concept standpoint and warms my heart. Fighters, psionic warriors. We have psionic fighters finally. Uh, yeah, psionic abilities, really great for a person playing a fighter who wants to have magic like abilities but maybe doesn't want all the bookkeeping of spell slots and things like that. If you have somebody that really enjoyed fourth edition and like being able to do interesting things with a martial character, they probably will really like the sign, the Psy warrior because they get to do a lot of those interesting things without having to worry about managing all the magic. And then we have the rune knight, which is based all around giant runes and using those to like embolden your abilities and things like that. Honestly, it was okay, but the runes lacked a certain oomph for me. A, a lot of them grant you advantage on certain skills. I think if they granted you proficiency in those skills, that would make them jump off the page a lot more and not fall as flat. Monk, Way of Mercy, Plague Doctor Monks with the mask and everything. It's awesome, but the abilities sometimes betray the flavor. The 17th level ability, Ultimate Mercy, is a resurrection ability. When in the flavor, it describes the ultimate mercy being ending a creature suffering through death. So the ultimate mercy doesn't really land with the flavor that well. I really like the concept of this subclass, but I feel like the execution betrays it. Way of the Astral Self, if you want to be the ancient one from Doctor Strange, this is it. This is how you do it. It's really cool. You can have extra arms. So play it. Paladins. Oath of Glory from Theros. Uh, it's good. It's a fun leader type paladin, really heavily focused on charisma, and you occasionally can do some buffy type stuff for your party members. And then Oath of the Watchers. This might be my favorite subclass in the entire book. It's so evocative from the mechanics to the flavor everywhere. The idea of this order of paladins that protect the material plane from all outsiders, regardless of alignment, celestial aberrations, fiends, None of you belong here, and we're going to keep you out. Rangers. So you have the Fey Wanderer, which is a really cool, uh, evocative subclass of this idea of touched by the Fey. It does have an ability called Otherworldly Glamour, which can get you a plus eight in charisma checks that you have proficiency in at a relatively early level, which it's not as bad as the College of Eloquence by a long shot, but it might be a bit too beefy. I, I would need to see it at a table to know whether or not if somebody built it with this in mind, a plus eight is going to break things down as much as a guaranteed 17 College of Eloquence. And the other Ranger subclass is the Swarm Keeper. This one is super creepy and very cool. You control insects and that's really neat. And I, I think it's one of the most unique subclasses when stacked up against the other Ranger options and you're definitely gonna have a player that is super pumped to play this character. Now, Rogue, I wanna take a moment because all these classes have new optional class features, things that you could, with the DM's permission, plug into your class, and they're really cool, like the fighter gets some new fighting styles, stuff like that. The Rogue, though, the one that they get is something called Steady Aim, where you can use your bonus action to gain advantage on an attack roll, but your movement speed becomes zero immediately for until the start of your next turn. And if you moved before taking the bonus action, then you can't use it. So the idea is you sacrifice your movement to take a moment, take aim, and then strike. 
I think this should be for everybody. I think it's really cool. I like that concept and that mechanic. I don't know why only rogues get it. I think especially like archer fighters, rangers, they should definitely be able to get a hold of this. And if you wanted to make it not so min maxi for like a melee character, because they're not going to have to move a whole lot anyway, just say a ranged attack roll. But anyway, that was my only gripe. I think this should be for everybody, but I really like the class feature. Okay, the rogue subclasses. Phantom. It's really cool, and the flavor is really neat, trapping creature souls in little trinkets that you carry around with you, and you can, like, use the trinkets or even destroy them to do different things, which I wish there were more uses for them. That was my only gripe, is it doesn't feel like there's enough that you can do with them. Uh, for example, there's a class feature called Whispers of the Dead, which you get proficiency in something that you normally don't have proficiency in. It would be really cool if you could destroy one of the soul trinkets to use that ability whenever you want as opposed to, I think it's it's got a limit on how many times per day you can use it. Let us destroy a soul trinket and do that whenever. Stuff like that, I think, would make this subclass cooler, but overall, I do really like it. And Soul Knife is here, a fan favorite subclass. Well, I think it was a whole class unto itself in previous editions, but the rogue now has the Soul Knife, psionic rogue with knives that you just create and can throw around and stab people with. And it's great. Their coolest ability, in my opinion, is psychic teleportation, where you can throw a soul knife into the ground, I think up to 60 feet away, and then you teleport to where you threw it. That is super cool and will allow you to move around the battlefield really quickly. So I really like that. Sorcerer has the Aberrant Mind, which is the psionics option. And it does a really good job of having the features of the subclass play into the psionic abilities of the subclass, but still allowing for a lot of flexibility with the spell casting side of being a sorcerer and leaves a lot of the repackaging of spells up to the player to make them psionic in nature through description as opposed to creating a bunch of new spells for them to use. So I really like that. See, there's no need to create a bunch of new spells when you can just say that it's psionic in nature. And the Clockwork Soul Sorcerer is also really cool. I really like this one. This and Oath of the Watchers are the two I want to play the most right now. Uh, but the Clockwork Soul, it its class features, it really shines in how it can almost control the dice and like grant advantage or take it away or remove disadvantage because everything has to be in its place and has to like work like clockwork. So very cool. The, the way that the flavor marries with the mechanics really well makes this subclass shine really bright for me, and I really like it. Next up is the Warlock. Now, another class feature thing to touch on, a lot of these classes, like the fighter with fighting style, allow you when you hit those ASI levels where you're making your ability score improvements, they allow you to like switch your fighting style or, or switch some of those decisions that you make within a subclass. The Warlock lets you change your Pact choice, not like Fiend, Great Old Ones, but I mean uh, Pact of the Chain, Pact of the Blade, they let you change that when you hit an ASI. So, I mean, from a balance standpoint, that it makes sense. But I feel like with the Eldritch Invocations, having your pact be a prerequisite for a lot of those, changing that is just so much admin and so big of a thing. So I get it. But at the same time, it seems like a lot to be able to just swap on an ability score improvement level. It evokes much more to me the idea of changing your subclass completely as opposed to just changing a fighting style like a fighter. So the Warlock, first off, does have a new Pact Boon option, Pact of the Talisman, which is really cool. It's very structured, I, I feel like, around the idea of protecting other people. And you can have this magical talisman that you, you have the option to give to other people and it provides them protection and allows you to like teleport to them and stuff like that through different Eldritch Invocations. So very cool, a totally different kind of warlock than was present before, which I really appreciate and like. So definitely worth checking out. Uh, the warlock gets two subclasses, the first one being fathomless, the idea of having a pact with this like underwater entity uh, that is very evocative of great old ones, but much more flavored around the deep, deep sea. And its most intense ability is you can cast uh, Evard's Black Tentacles, where your concentration can't be broken by damage at like 10th level, which is pretty cool. And then the other subclass is the genie option, which is solid. It's fine. It just, it didn't, it didn't wow me 
like fathomless was really cool and i'm fairly familiar with the other warlock options and i just feel like genie kind of falls flat it has some great utility but it doesn't feel special and the wizard first off we have blade singing which was in sword coast adventurer's guide previously it's it's the most unique wizard option in my opinion it's super cool but potentially kind of hard to build since you have a lot of different abilities that have to be good to be a frontline caster. So that's my only concern, but overall it's really cool. And the Order of the Scribe subclass is a really cool concept, but it's 14th level ability, one with the word, is devastating potentially for the character if the rolls don't go their way. Like it can remove spells from your spell book for like a week possibly. So it's a cool concept, but the level 14 ability is very potentially punitive if things don't go your way. And lastly, in chapter one are the feats options. Uh, they're, they're great. There's some cool options. A lot of ones focused on combat, some utility ones, nothing that jumps off the page, nothing that I felt like, oh, I have to talk about this in the video, but th they're good options. They're solid. Chapter two, group patrons. So if you had picked up Eberron Rising from the Last War, then you're very familiar with this chapter because it's virtually the same. Uh, they, they filed the serial numbers off to make it not Eberron anymore, but most of the group types are the same. You have Academy, Crime Syndicate, uh, I'm not gonna list all of them, but there, there's a wide variety, Immortal Being, uh, which is a really cool one, but there's, there's nothing that was so different from the Eberron version to where it was like, oh, if you liked this, in Eberron, then you need to pick up this book because it expands on it. It doesn't really do that, unfortunately. It does provide different types, like so for Academy. In the Eberron book, it was listed as University, and it listed very specifically Morgrave University in that world. In this, it says Academy, and then it has like sub-options of the type of Academy, which is cool. That That is an additional thing, which I do appreciate, but there's not enough to where I would be able to tell somebody, just for the group patrons, go out and pick this book. It's great. If you didn't pick up the Eberron book for whatever reason, you're going to love this chapter. It's great from a storytelling standpoint, whether your party does use the group patron option, or if you just need cool adventure ideas as a DM, you can flip through that and be like, this organization needs the party to help them. Or if you're writing a character's backstory, you can look at these organizations and think, okay, I want my character to be from one of these. How do I write that story? And there's some great material in this chapter to get those creative juices flowing to write a compelling backstory. Next up is chapter three, Magic Miscellany. Uh, this one has spells and magic items in it, obviously. And in the spell section, it has a mix of new spells and then spells that are reprinted from Sword Coast Adventures Guide, Icewind Dale, uh, some that have come over from Unearthed Arcana, and I'm sure some other sources that I missed when I was <laughs> doing my research for this review. There are a lot of great spells in here. I'm gonna give you my top five spells that I really like that jumped off the page to me just to keep this section concise, but there are a lot of really good spells. And if you had skipped over uh, Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide because you don't play in Faerun or Icewind Dale because you write your own adventures, the, the spells that are reprinted from those are really cool spells that I would recommend checking out and using. I'm not gonna cover them here. Uh, but I'm just going to do my top five new spells included in the book, which the first one is going to be a cantrip. It's called Mind Sliver, and it's like a psionic type ability based on the art associated with it. But this one is a tactical dream when you're fighting legendary enemies, when you're needing to get them to burn through their legendary resistance before you pull out the big guns. This allows you to actually remove uh, numbers from their saving throw to get them to fail more often on those lower spells so then you can really start hammering them with the good stuff. Four, three, and two, since I'm counting down to my favorite spell, are uh, unsurprisingly three of the coolest spells are Tasha's new spells. I wonder why she would name the coolest spells after herself. The first one is Tasha's Caustic Brew. This one splashes acid on enemies and the reason I really like it is the enemies either take a decent amount of damage or you tip the action economy way in your favor when the fight is going on because the enemies have to take their action to wipe the acid off to stop the ongoing damage. So that's why I really like this one is you can play that action economy game with this spell really well. Uh, Tasha's Mind Whip is very much in a similar vein. It's all about controlling actions. Uh, the, the person that's hit with it can't take a reaction and on their turn they have to pick 
a action move or bonus action and they can only do one of those so it's it's really cool and i uh, can once again manipulate the the meta of the encounter as opposed to the actual like i move you 10 feet it's like no you have to pick which which thing you're going to do on your turn which i really like tasha's otherworldly guys is great for casters they get caught in a corner and they have enemies coming down on them and you can cast the spell and all of a sudden you're a frontline fighter and your melee attacks count as magical damage and all this cool stuff uh so it's a great kind of nuclear option of like i need to get out now boom otherworldly guys so definitely very cool but my favorite spell is dream of the blue veil this spell can break your game I'm just going to put that out there uh, first and foremost. Uh, Dream of the Blue Veil allows the player and potentially the party not to travel to another plane. It allows them to travel to another world. As in, you're running a campaign in Faerun, and they're like, hey, let's go check out Eberron. Yeah, that'll be fun. Cast Dream of the Blue Veil. Off to Eberron. I hear Ravnica's nice this time of year. Off to Ravnica. Yeah, it's... I uh, it's very cool. Don't get me wrong, but as a DM, if I ever had a player say, "I'm going to cast Dream of the Blue Veil," I would just be like, "Okay, let me just rip up my campaign notes." You know, there's obviously fine ways to deal with your players doing that. Um, but it's it's so cool and I really like the the chaos that it introduces at the table. And so Dream of the Blue Veil is my favorite spell from the book. The next section is the personalizing spells section which is all about uh kind of like what i talked about with the swarm keeper describing your spells in a way that is inherently personal to your caster this is something i already encourage at my tables but it's nice to have it codified in a first party book just in case you have a rules lawyer when it comes to the appearance of spells and they're like no it says the spell looks like this in the the book so it has to look this way this gives you some ammunition to be like no actually it says that I can describe it as being chickens, so I'm going to describe them as being chickens. I only say that because the art is a farmer casting magic missile, and all of the magic darts look like chickens. That's how wacky it gets, but it's still really good, something I already encourage at my table, and I would recommend you all doing it at your table as well, but it's nice to have it codified in a book. Now, in the magic items section, uh, two things really struck me as being special about this magic item section. Firstly, there are a ton of of spell books. If you're playing a wizard, you definitely want to pick this book up, not just for the new spells and all that kind of stuff, but there are a ton of spell books that you can find and pick up and learn spells from, and they all have really cool, unique properties to the spell book in and of itself. So it's really cool and a wide variety, and I really like that. And there's also a handful of artifacts that are really cool. I think I'll do another video like doing a deep dive on the artifacts just because there's so much text. And I, my favorite thing about artifacts is how to destroy them. So I definitely want to de dive deep into those and talk about them. But the two that I will shout out as being my favorite are the Mighty Servant of Luke Ko, because it's Pacific Rim in D&D, &D, and the Teeth of Dalur Nar, just because it involves random tables and rolling on them and creating chaos. And I like that as a dungeon master and as a player, but mostly as a dungeon master. And th there's a lot of really great storytelling opportunities that you can get from rolling on these tables. So I really like that. And the final chapter, DM's tools. There are some really good things in this chapter. As a, a DM that's been doing it for a while, I initially looked at the table of contents and there were some things I was like, I already, eh, I, I know. But this chapter really did surprise me in a lot of ways. The first section is on session zero, which I there's nothing like, oh my gosh, I'd never thought about that before. But the one thing that I do appreciate that they did, and I'm hoping it'll raise awareness of things like soft limits and hard limits of having that conversation with your players about, OK, what is OK to be at the table, but in a sensitive way, what is OK to never be at the table and having that conversation is important. And if you've been gaming together for a long time, don't assume that, you know, just have that conversation, allow people to say, I'm not really comfortable with this being in the game and move on from there. So I do appreciate that they included that bit. And hopefully it'll elevate awareness on that uh, relatively new practice at a lot of tables. The sidekick section, obviously we had the Unearthed Arcana Sidekicks uh, document that came out a while back, but now it's in a book. And I think it does a really great job of making the sidekicks feel special and unique and useful and not just like watered down PCs. 
especially the expert sidekick, I really like. They had a lot of really cool abilities built around using the help action, which I love for a sidekick. That makes total sense that they would be just helping you out the whole time. So I really liked all of the options for the sidekick, but the expert was the one that really shown for me. Okay, parlaying with monsters was the first section that I went, I, I know how to role play monsters. I know that a lot of people just have them fight, but I, I know how to do that. And that's not what this section is about. But like, uh, when I looked at the table of contents, that was my initial thought, but this section proved me wrong. It has a lot of great tables that you can roll on, but you can also just go and pick and choose through different the different types of monsters and their wants and needs and what they would need to receive in order to be willing to talk to the party. And it's a great tool for a DM in a pinch who has an enemy that they think the party's just going to fight and the face of the party says, I want to walk up and talk to him first. And it's like, okay, yes, this is what they want in order for them to be friendly with you. So it, and, and also there's just a lot of really cool storytelling things you can do with the entries in this section. So the parlaying with monsters section, don't sleep on it. Don't look at the table contents and be like, I know how to role play monsters. Thank you. Definitely give it a look. There's a lot of really good stuff to mine out of that section. Okay. The environmental hazards section, which uh, covers supernatural regions, magical phenomenon, and then natural, uh, actual hazards. I'm not going to get too much in the natural hazard section because it's like avalanches and stuff like that which it's fine. It gives you a lot of good tools to use when the party encounters things like that. Uh, but there wasn't anything like worth diving deep in. But the supernatural region section was also another one that I thought, oh, I, I really like Eberron. I know how manifest zones work. I'm sure this is just like with the group patrons them bringing this over. I was wrong. I was very wrong. Supernatural regions are very cool. It's, it's almost uh, like the idea of Barovia from Curse of Strata, the section of the world being supernaturally different. And I really like that. And the way that they do it, they like a wide gamut of different ones from really cool and exciting to super creepy. And they have good sec long sections on how to play each one of them and things that will happen to the party when, when other things trigger certain things to happen. So once again, don't sleep on this section. There's a lot of really cool stuff. And maybe down the line, we can do a deeper dive into that section and my thoughts on the different supernatural regions. And the magical phenomena section right after it is, is kind of like mini supernatural regions where it's like, rather than having the party go on an adventure to this weird supernatural place, you just want them to experience a, a weird thing on the road kind of thing. So that's what that is. And it's still really cool. And there's a good variety of different things that you can pull from that. So they, they kind of work in tandem. I would probably actually have like a couple magical phenomena along the road leading up to a supernatural region as like clues to like, oh, things are getting weird and now they're super weird. But both those sections are great. And the last section of the book are the puzzles, which once again, don't sleep on this section either. The, the puzzles are really inventive and really good. And yeah, a lot of us know how to make puzzles for D&D, &D, but the puzzles in this are great. And they're, they're built in such a way to where you can drop them into any dungeon or ruin or anything like that. And it is a great reminder that super simple puzzles just need a fresh coat of paint in order to be something really new and feel unique and really engage the players. Most of the puzzles in the, in the section are based off of like, I don't want to go as mean as say like elementary school, but very basic logic puzzles, but they present them in such a way to where they feel like they belong in a fantasy dungeon. And I, that's a great reminder to have of like, you can take these very simple, straightforward things and present them in such a way to be something really, truly special. In you. Okay. So Tasha's cauldron of everything. Do I think you should buy it? I'm glad that I pre-ordered it. Like I, I, once again, huge thank you to, to wizards of the coast for sending me a copy. I have another copy on the way. And so I'm really excited. Uh, by the content in the book, I really want to play <laughs> in a game and get to use some of this stuff. But there's also a lot of great stuff from a Dungeon Master perspective that you can use. So I, I certainly think it's worth the price of admission. I think it's worth picking up and I would recommend it. Uh, the, the highlights for me, the character creation stuff, the amount that you get is wonderful. But, you know, there are some things in there that are kind of hit and miss. The DM tool section is great. 
Uh, but the, the thing that really I, I got excited about was all of the new spells and magic items. There, there's a lot of really cool stuff that you can use in there. So chapter three is definitely where I'm going to continue going back to over and over again. But anyway, thank you all so much for watching. I have been Eric, and I'll see you next time.